you for joining us online. Here at the house, we love to hear what God is doing in your life. If you have a testimony, please send it to amen at hotl.church. If House of the Lord has impacted you in any way and you'd like to partner with us financially, please visit our website, hotl.church, and click the top right. Or you can text the dollar amount to 84321. Thanks again for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the message and have a great day. This is going to be good this weekend, Labor Day weekend, right? Some of you are wish you were camping. Maybe not. It's all good. It's all good. All right. Thank you so much. In Matthew, I want to I want to just open up with a passage of scripture that I am going to um, start with this weekend, and then we're going to pray. Amen. Um, Matthew sixteen eighteen. Jesus said, and I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. So Jesus, I pray uh, that you would just help us to receive, help me to release, help me to teach, help me to communicate. Uh, Lord, help me to just um, be present, not in the way, allow your Holy Spirit to speak, and help your people to receive. In Jesus' name, and they said, Amen. Listen, I'm excited because we are launching a new fall series this week. Isn't it amazing that we can say it's like almost the, it it feels like, doesn't feel like the fall. Did did you feel, doesn't it feel like you just got ripped off? I mean, it feels like I just want to take the calendar and go back to like, this is August 1st. We're just deciding this is August 1st because it just feels crazy to me. So anyway, but we're starting a new series, and uh, it's called Heart for the House. And we've got so many people coming into our, our, our church community, and it's amazing the people that we have joining us uh, online as well. And I want to take a few weeks to talk about what church, and especially this church, the one that Jesus is building, is all about. And And how many of you recognize it's hard to... It's hard to have a heart for something unless you know the heart in something. It, it, it's hard to have a heart for something unless you know the heart in something. How about that person that, that maybe you are considering or were considering marrying? I mean, it's really important because sometimes from the outside everything looks good, but you realize as you get to know the heart, there's a, you know, it's a big part of it. And, and I love old classic cars. Classic cars are like one of my favorites, especially muscle cars. We, you know, every once in a while you see an old j- jalopy or something like that. And those just never really kind of turn my crank. But when I see a muscle car, I'm just like, mm, that's right. That's right. I mean, I can hear the music coming on already. And, you know, and, and uh, uh, but especially, especially Mustangs. I love classic Mustangs because that's what I had when I was in high school. And, I've got a friend of mine that actually his wife bought him, unbeknownst to him, bought him like his dream car for his 60th birthday this year. And I'm like, I was so inspired. I've been throwing hints at my wife. You know, I'm not 60 yet, but it's coming. And it's like, hey, I'm just just saying. Uh, but So I'll peruse some of these classic Mustangs occasionally, and they can look great from the outside. So I got a picture I just felt like I wanted to show you a picture. I mean, didn't that thing just look great from the outside? Uh, Okay, if you guys aren't excited about somebody, somebody tomorrow morning will be excited about. I know it. I I, I know it. But then, but then, what happens is you got to open the hood, you know. So, and how many of you know what's wrong with this picture right here? Because I looked at this great looking Mustang. And then I looked at the picture and I go, that's got a six banger in it, man. That's not right. Right? I mean, because the next picture shows what should be under the hood. And that, you know, that that's what I'm talking about right there. See, it's important that you know what's under the hood. And sometimes a car can be like what we would call a 50-footer. Looks really good from 50 feet away. But then when you get close to it, you know, you can see the maybe the Bondo, or actually if you're a really, really sharp person when you're looking at classic cars, you take like a metal detector with you. 
a magnet, you know, so, so you're just trying to find out, you know, how, have they passed this thing up and everything. So, so I, I, I want to talk to you this weekend. First of all, I want to say that if you're looking for the perfect church, it's not going to happen because it's full of people that are imperfect, but they're on a journey toward Jesus. And honestly, it's one of the reasons that I love the church and I love the house because of the opportunity to be part of the process that Jesus is doing. And so, and then, and then when you love someone, you find yourself participating in what they love to do. See, if, you, if it's a committed relationship, you actually build something together. I mean, that's because your hearts now are coming together. You build together. You build a life. You build a family. You build a home. And, and Jesus is calling people to Him. And He's building one person at a time and using a community of people in the process. So that's just the beauty of everything is that the, the broken and the, the lost and you know come in and then Jesus is building and He's using people that look like you and I to do this. And then we're all as well in this process and his church is being built not with superstars not with perfect people not with with personalities but those who are lost wounded and broken but as these kind of people and i'll just be honest with these are my kind of people the people that i love as as jesus grows in them the church grows and i think you have to have an amazing heart to realize the grace and the redemption that comes as Jesus grows in them. Ephesians 2.22 says, In whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. 1 Peter 1.2.5 says, And you also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So, some of what we want to cover in this series are the core values or what's under the hood. It's really important because people many times, they, 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 they question, what is the church? Who is the church? I don't need the church. And, and sometimes people have been hurt by the church. They've been rejected by the church. And we understand that there's this process that we go, or it's popular to criticize the church. And I think we spend more time being critical of the church and critical of different ministries that what we should. It's really important that we gr- we grasp this. I, I I love my wife and I love people, but if I had somebody that was consistently being critical of my wife, even if some of the stuff they brought was true, there would be a point where I just begin to like, okay, you know what? I know she's not perfect, but I'm going to get in between her and you, and I'm going to protect her. See, and that's Jesus and the bride. And I think we've got to be really, really careful. It says in Isaiah 58, 9, this is really a, a, a sobering passage of Scripture. But it says, Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and He will say, Here I am, if you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger, and speaking wickedness. Like, bam, mic drop right there got to be careful because Jesus is building this church. He's building His church that she would be without spot or wrinkle. And there are people who have lost faith in the church, have been hurt, been rejected by the church. We get that. I get that. But I've not lost faith in the church because Jesus is still building His church. So how do we know what this church is supposed to be, supposed to look like? I mean, if somebody was painting a portrait and painting you know, a picture of what it's supposed to look like. And the answer that I believe is that the more that you study who Jesus is, the more that you see what the church should be. The more that you draw close to Him and know Him, the more that you see what the church should be. See, you find the core values of the church by looking at the core value of the builder. And that's Jesus. And if I could sum the whole thing up, it's like, remember that people are the mission. 
people are the mission. That's really simplified. That's really what it's about. You know, if you think about this, every artist, every songwriter, every builder, every inventor has a unique characteristics. And there's no two of them that are alike. And so, the thing that I want to talk about this weekend is the church under the hood should be redemptive by nature. It should be redemptive by nature. See, it is Jesus is the foundation, the builder of the church. You see the redemptive nature that must flow to be in alignment with the builder. And I think it's interesting, this interchange between Jesus and the disciples. So if I look at, if I look at Luke chapter 9, we're not going to go through the whole thing, but um, we see that, that, that in this chapter, Jesus uh, had basically asked Peter who he would say he was, and Peter confessed that Jesus was the Christ. And that we see in, also in chapter 9 that Jesus was transfigured, you know, the Mount of Transfiguration. We see that in this chapter, in this in this timeline that there was a boy that was that was healed so the disciples have been traveling with Jesus they've been watching him they've been listening to him they see a couple miracles even and they still didn't know what was under the hood they still didn't know what the core heart that he had because we find it illustrated here and Luke chapter 9 verse 51 through 55. It says, when the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of Samaritan to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set towards Jerusalem. And when his disciples James and John saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. I just think this is such a great teaching moment right now. Because here is, you know, James and uh, basically, James and John were called the, the sons of thunder. And I think this is part of why. Because I think they were like, come on, man, we're just going to call it down on them right now. And Jesus actually turned to them and just said, you don't know what's under the hood. You don't know what... So, so, so when we look at this, what did Jesus say about Himself? Because He was, he was beginning to... He was trying to, to reveal what, was his, what were His core values. What were the things inside that were important. And we find that as we continue on. See, in, in Luke 9.56, He said, For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. Mark 10, 45 says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give His life a ransom for many. And in Luke 19, 10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. So we see multiple times where Jesus is actually speaking. The Bible says that the mouth speaks out of the abundance of the heart. So he's actually revealing to himself what's revealing to others around him what's under the hood. And if we look at that, it's like Jesus is saying, I'm coming to seek and I'm looking for someone. I'm always on the search. I'm looking for those. I'm looking for people. See, and the church that Jesus is building should always have the motivation to be seeking. You know, I've got this little... um, this new little bird dog pup. And she's about six months old now. She's a little red setter. Her name is Molly. And uh, I took Molly to, to doggy school. I've been kind of working with Molly and I decided, okay, I'm going to kind of take her to another level. And one of the things that you're looking for in a, in, a, in a bird dog, no matter you know if it's a pointing dog or a flushing dog, is what they call prey drive. You're actually looking for does she have this motor that runs when she gets into the hunting mode that she gets really, really... I mean, you want that dog to be all jacked up. You want her to be excited. You know, if a bird flies by and she ignores it, it's like, hey, yo, you're supposed to be a bird dog. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you're not a hot dog. You're a bird dog. And, and, and so, you know, you're looking for that. But there's something sometimes that is missing in us as the body because when we look at the heart of Jesus... 
and the heart of the redemptive part, it should always be looking for that which is lost and that which needs to be saved. See, Jesus was taken to task by the religious leaders of the day who grumbled. And you know what they said? They said, this man receives sinners and eats with them. Because that was totally different from the doctrine that they had been brought up. Jesus was flipping the script. He was doing something. See, their, 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 their whole thing is, is He was seeking. And so Jesus responds to this criticism, and we find this in Luke 15 about the lost sheep and leaving the 99 to find the one. This was counter to their culture. See, their doctrine was that people were lost, but God would never go to them. Jesus was saying, people are lost, and I am going to go to them. And they had a really hard time trying to basically process that. We must have this redemptive core value under the hood. What's under your hood? What's in your heart? This means that we need to be willing to go after people, risk rejection, relationship, praying for people instead of being judgmental toward them. And one of the things that gets overlooked even in the parable about the shepherd leaving the 99 for the one is the goal was to reinstate the one back into the fold. And we have to, we have to recognize that. Or the other parable that Jesus spoke in Luke chapter 15. We're going to read that one. Luke 15 verses 8 through 10. It says, Or what woman having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, right? Saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there's joy in the presence of angels of God over one sinner who repents. So this is Jesus. I'm telling you what, He's opening the hood. And He's saying, this is the important thing. I'm going to build my church. And these are the components that you have to have as we, as we love Him and we're building something together. And so this refers actually to the custom of a Jewish girl who would wear a headband of ten coins upon marriage. And so it'd be almost like it'd be almost like a wedding ring in our culture. And 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 so when we when we look at this, this this the coin would also have the image, would have an image of of the ruler of the coin. So if you if you you know the picture that I get from this is that Jesus is telling the story of someone looking for a lost coin, and that lost coin represents people that are created in the image of God. But if you, if you understand like even ancient coins, uh, there, there, there's, the, uh, there's the, the tarnishing, and the, and the very image that's on that can be, can be changed, and you know, it can be distorted, and it can be because of just you know, life, right? And, and that really is what is happening in the lives of people that don't know the Lord. I mean, life just is tough anyway. But then life without Jesus and without the regeneration, without the redemption, without the power of the Holy Spirit, there's something that happens where, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know about you, but I know that me without Jesus is not me in the way that God had viewed me and planned my life to be. And I think so many people live so far below the hopes and the purposes that God has for them. And, and, and God is, and Jesus is basically saying, hey, I'm going to build my church and I want us to be the kind of people that will sweep and look and not give up. And it's even kind of the way that they would sweep and the way that the floors were built in the day they would sweep so that they could, they could find something that would pop up between the crafts because things get lost in the cracks. And I think that people get lost in the cracks. And we've got to be, we've got to have that heart. So let's talk about redemption and being redemptive. See, we get this skewed definition of redemption 
because we hear stories or we see movies. And we, 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 we kind of think about redemption is like the athlete that overcomes challenges to be successful or the person who makes a mistake and then overcomes to gain respect or honor. But biblical redemption is different. Biblical redemption is that you didn't, you couldn't do anything to overcome sin and be restored to God and that you and I were redeemed by Jesus. He's the redemption. You, don't, you didn't earn it. Your works didn't do it. It's the, it's, the, it's the heart, it's the redemptive nature of Jesus that said, I'm going to do for you what you couldn't do for yourself. And He draws you to. And people say this, is like, well, I found the Lord. It's like, you know what? God was never lost. Actually, Jesus said that He came and He found you. And I love that because he was willing to search. He was willing to reach. And so now the church should be this redemptive community, a redemptive community. It kind of resonates in my, just that term because the builder has a heart of redemption. So what does that look like? What does being part of a redemptive community actually look like? Well, first of all, it's centered on redemption. Okay, you, you can't be a redemptive community unless there's something in you that's redemptive. And a redemptive church is focused on the gospel of Jesus. It, it's it's kind of simple. And really, what it should be like, it should look like a blessed mess. I mean, seriously, it should look like a blessed mess. A redemptive church is focused but look at, the, look at the people that Jesus went after. He went after tax collectors. He went after prostitutes. He went after the demon-possessed. He, he went after lepers. He went after ragtag, uneducated, and forgotten people. And that's what the church should look like. And then we're in process. And I think a redemptive church is transparent. I think it's transparent. We recognize that we all have flaws and sin and failures, and yet we don't become prideful or have a I've arrived syndrome because we're mindful of our redemptive redemption through Jesus. See, come on, let's be honest. We have, we have arguments. We're selfish with our time, with our resources. We have insecurities. We have frustrations. We fail. We fall. Come on, anybody reading me? Can you, can you feel me? And so at the same time, we, now here's what happens. It's like, okay, at the point of like failure, like, you know, when you first come to Jesus, there's just something in you that is so grateful because, oh, He saved me, He forgave me. And then, you know, you, I think in the process, you, you know, I, I still, I'm capable of sinning, but I sin less. I'm not sinless. But I sin a lot less than I did because the Holy Spirit and the regeneration, the Word of God's changing me. The things that I wanted to do, I don't do those things anymore. I'm learning, right? But here's the problem. The farther I get away from that point, sometimes the more spiritually arrogant I can be. And yet, that's not who we're called to be. Sometimes you gotta, you got to go back to the place where you remember what He saved you from. And it brings you to a point, back to a point of just humility and gratefulness. And like, God, man, without you, Jesus, man, I was lost. But now I'm found. And we have to, we have to maintain that heart. Because it's not about this perfect thing that happens. And it's not about this religious legalism stuff. We've got to be transparent. In the book of James, it says, confess your trespasses to one another. And pray for one another that you may be healed. And that transparency is always remembering we have an ongoing need for Jesus and the redemption that comes from Him. So a redemptive community is not surprised when there's conflict in your midst. They work through it. They realize, hey, you know what? we got to, we got to contend for some unity. We're going to work through stuff. 
We're not going to get a, an attitude, a attitude. We're not going to basically let... We're going to work through conflict. How many of you realize you don't stay married very long if you can't, won't work through conflict? Right? I mean, seriously, if you've been married for more than a week, you're having some conflict. Right? Anybody that's married says, Amen, Pastor, you're preaching. You got to work through it. You got to get better at it. You got to have some grace. You got to have some forgiveness. Why would that be any different in the church that Jesus is building? But sometimes we're not like that. Sometimes we're not. Sometimes we're, we, we're kind of hard. A redemptive community is not surprised when people fail. You know what they do? They forgive and they restore. They say, listen, listen, okay, I got gotcha. you. Just get back up again, and, and, and we're going to surround you. We're going we're gonna, to we're, we're, we're be with you. We're going to walk with you through this stuff. And, and, and what it does is it gives per people permission to say, okay, I'm not perfect, and I need help. A redemptive community rallies when they're suffering. They've, they have compassion. And they respond. Sometimes when people are going through stuff and they're brave enough to say, hey, I'm, I'm kind of having some problems right here. A lot of times people are like, they just kind of like back away. Instead of saying, hey, listen, you don't have to walk through this alone. We're with you in this. We may not have all the answers, but we know who does. We, we may not be able to fix everything, but we know that basically Jesus, we're inviting Him, the power of the Holy Spirit, and there's a redemptive heart that we have to walk with people through things. A redemptive community is not full of pretend perfect people. PP people. I don't like being around pretend perfect people. Because you know what? They're not. They're not. They're not, so it's kind of disingenuous. You know, it's like, they're not. So why pretend to be something that you're not? You ever been around somebody that pretends to be something that they're not? It, it really is. So we, we just got to recognize, okay, let's keep it authentic. Let's keep it real. And I think a redemptive church, a redemptive community is willing to touch people. They're, they're willing to touch people. Luke 5, verse 12 through 13. It says, While he was in one of the cities, there came a man full of leprosy. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and begged him, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, which was a huge no no in that, in that culture. Because once you touch somebody like that, then you're unclean. I mean, it's crazy. But he touched him, and Jesus, he touched him saying, I will be clean, and immediately the leprosy left him. So Jesus was willing to touch a man that other people shunned. Are we willing to touch people that other people shun? Other P, it's awkward. Awkward Andy showed up again, right? Nobody watching or is here is named Andy because you're not awkward. You're perfect. See, be willing to extend the gospel to people that are awkward. That it would be awkward. Can I say this? Don't be great at fellowship, but poor at outreach. Don't be great at fellowship. We're, we're world-class fellowship. Seriously, fellowship, that's kind of a, I mean, it's a good word. It's a Bible word. We understand it. If you grew up in church, you understand it. It's kind of a, it's fellowship. I'm a really good fellowshipper. I'm a really good potlucker, right? I mean, we love this stuff. It's really good. And there's something about breaking the bread of community that's good. We were created for community. We need each other. Something about being with people. And we're really good about doing that. But we've got to not just be world-class fellowship. We've got to be world-class reachers. We've got to reach. 
See, a redemptive church reaches and builds redemptive relationships. We've got to be intentional. Jesus was intentional. See, Jesus would look for common ground. And we look for common ground. I mean, it's really simple. 101, 101. You just go out and you find somebody. You're, run, you're working with somebody. You run into somebody. It's not hard. You try to find some common ground. That's what Jesus actually did. And then He built a relationship from there. Look for ways to serve. Look for ways to bless. Listen, people love to be served. There's something that just responds. And, and here's four thoughts. Four thoughts and four actions I, I want to leave you with that I, that I think will help. Number one, love speaks. Love speaks. Love is not silent. I'm talking about actually opening your mouth and being willing to share your testimony with somebody. In Psalm 107.2, it says, Let the redeemed of the... There's that word redeemed. Redemption redeemed. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Right? Who <laughs> He has redeemed from trouble. So you'll find it's easier to share your testimony than you think. It could be something simply like, man, I went through what you're going through and I prayed and God really helped me. Find that common ground and, and, and recognize that many times God will give you just a a segue into something because why? Jesus in you wants to reach people. And, and, and what happens is that you're never going to be truly fulfilled in life if you fight that thing. I'm not comfortable with people. I'm not comfortable talking with people. I'm telling you, get a little better at it. Get a little bolder at it. Because you're partnering with Jesus. He's building His church and you have to realize, he opened the hood of his heart and he said, I came to seek that which was lost. So if we're loving him and we're partnering with him and we're building, when you love someone, you actually get involved with the things that they're involved with. Amen? You do. My wife, I love my wife. I was not a coffee drinker until I married her. And she would go to a coffee shop or a I mean, back in the day, they didn't have these like, you know, like high end, really, really good coffee stuff. It's like, dude, I grew up with like Folgers, you know, instant coffee, right? Grandma would make instant coffee. And I'm like, oh, that stuff just tastes terrible. But because I loved her, she loved to go to like a cafe and she loved to just drink coffee. I mean, gallons of coffee. We just, but I, so I, I started loving what she loved. And because I loved her, I also began to go shopping with her. I was not a shopper. I'm a lot more of a shopper now because, because I loved her that she would, you know, and the crazy thing is we'll go shopping somewhere to do something and then pretty soon she's shopping for me because she loves me. And I think she loves the, the experience of bringing me into what she, you build stuff together and you do things together. I even got her to go hunting with me, believe it or not, more than once. I kind of ruined it. I, I wasn't, I remember one time, the first, I mean, we haven't been married very long, and I took her opening day of deer season to Mount Chapaca. It's about 6,000 feet in elevation. Opening day, October. We had a tent, we had a sleeping bag, we had a Springer Spaniel. And it snowed about three or four inches. And it was like 10 degrees. I mean, it was cold. Guess who still got up to go hunting? I couldn't figure out why she didn't want to go with me very much after that. But there's something when you love someone and you're partnered with them that your hearts start being involved and you're building something together. Evangelism has been described as one beggar telling another where he found bread. Number two, love prays. Love prays. Pray for an opportunity to build relationships. You know, think about this. The average person in their lifetime will develop two, maybe three, 
strong relationships. It takes an exponential. Jesus actually built relationship with 12 people. That's kind of out of the, that's out of the norm. So I, I really believe to be a kingdom person, there's something in you that you have to say, hey, listen, I'm going to pray for an opportunity to build relationships. They're going to start. Maybe I'll find some common ground. Maybe I can serve. Maybe I can bless. But think about this. What would happen if you prayed for three people each week that you know that need Jesus and for God to open the door of relationship? I mean, if that's, in, if that's under the hood, in the heart of God, guess what? I think it's going to happen. I would love to challenge you as the church that Jesus is building to just each week just pray for, might be a co-worker, might be a neighbor, might be a, a family member, but just pray three people, Lord, I know that they need you and I'm praying for an opportunity to serve them, to bless them, to build relationship, to find some common ground and ultimately share a testimony of what you've done in my life. Sometimes that's the easiest thing to do. And we get really weird about it. It's like, we'll build a relationship, and then it's like, oh my gosh, i got to pop the question. <laughs> right? Right? <laughs> it's not like that. It's like just be natural and sharing your faith. I mean, just, just get better at it. You, how many of you were born with the ability to do everything really well? You weren't. You were born balling, you were born naked. Those are the two things you did really well. You learn everything else. You just gotta, you just gotta kind of put yourself out there and you'll find your own rhythm. You'll find your own way. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And I'm telling you, people are lonely. They're lost. They need what you have inside you. The next thing is love welcomes. Be a welcoming family. Be a welcoming church. People come in all the time. And our desire is they would encounter Jesus. And most of the time, if I can say, this is going to be through you. It's going to be Christ in you is the hope of glory. It's going to be through you. I mean, when they walk in the door looking for God, guess what? They're, they're, we're, we're believing that they're going to experience the power and the presence of God. But guess what? They're going to see Jesus' hands and feet and His heart through you. So be that. Be that. And finally, love invites. Love invites. I'm closing this down right now. Surveys show 70% of people have not come to church because no one ever invited them. And those same people said that they would most likely come if somebody would just invite. The power of invitation is amazing. How many of you have said yes to something that you didn't really want to because it was easier, it was hard to say no? That's the power of invitation. That's why young people sometimes, they do stuff they not because they, they can't say no. It's easier to just say yes than is no. God put a yes in us, and that yes in us was basically for Him. To say yes to Him. But Jesus would do stuff like, hey, come and follow me. And they would follow Him. And then He would basically share life with them. The power of invitation is incredible. I've, I'm not going to do it today, but I have illustrated that point so many times like when I've taught leadership stuff. I'll be in a room and I'll talk to people about the power of invitation because we don't really exercise it. And I'll, and I'll take some... Some person will say, hey, hey, George, why don't you come over here? And then George will get up, and I'll, never mind, and he'll go sit down. And I'll, come on, George, get up here. And he'll come up, I can get somebody to do it two or three times. And I'm illustrating something. There's something in you that just, okay, it's a yes. Can I just ask you tonight, this weekend, to respond to that yes that's being released from the heart of God? I mean, Jesus is looking for people. He's, he's, he's seeking, He's searching that which was lost. And I believe He's asking His church, hey, if you want to build and build according to my heart, I'm building my church. Would you say yes? 
Jesus encountered a broken woman at the well. She began to testify and live a life of invitation in response to the gospel. Jesus delivered a man from demonic bondage, and the man began to testify and live a life of invitation in response to the gospel. We were all beggars, and we received the bread of life through redemption. So let's be a redemptive church community that's on mission. That's what's under the hood. It's not about trying to figure out how we can have, you know, I I could care less about programs. I could care less about some of the stuff that that we end up doing. What I want is I want to find the heart of God in everything that we do. It's not about polish. It's not about show. I mean, we do what we do. But my, the cry of my heart is that people would experience the heart of Jesus. Because there's broken people. There's lonely people. There's people that are waiting for the gift that is you. Because Jesus is in you. And I believe that's the heart of the gospel. Let's be a redemptive church community that's on mission. I want to be on mission. I don't, I don't want to just walk through the motions. I don't want to play church. I don't want to play religion. I don't want to do that stuff. I want to see people that are coming to life. The Bible says that you were dead in your trespasses, but now you come to life in Christ. Man, I want to be part of the process. I want to see people come alive in Jesus. I want to see people uh, lifed with the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to see addictions broken. I want to see relationships healed. I want to see people physically get touched and, and healed. I want to see families being brought together. I want to see oppressed people be released. I mean, I think that's the heart of Jesus. And that's a redemptive church. That's a redemptive church. That's a redemptive community. Can I just challenge you and ask you, can you be like Jesus? Can you be looking for someone? Can you be looking for someone? They're not hard to find. You see them everywhere. You can see them by their countenance. You can see by their situations, by their circumstances. There's so much opportunity and potential because we are surrounded by people that need Jesus. If we have that redemptive core value, that's got to be under the hood. I'm telling you what, it will be some of the most fulfilling things that you do. And you don't have to be weird about it. Just love people. Be compassionate. Look for something in common. Pray for them and say yes and be on mission. Come on, can I just challenge us this weekend? Let's be that redemptive community. I'm going to pray in Jesus' name. Father, I thank You for Your heart. And I pray that, God, Your heart is our heart. And that Your heart is the heart of the church that You're building. I thank You so much. I pray that even right now, if there's someone in here that they never responded to the invitation of, I want to be a follower of this Jesus, that maybe, maybe today's the day that they make that step, they take that step of faith. Maybe they're watching with us online and it's the time where you're saying, okay, it, it's time for me. I've heard about this Jesus, but today's the day that I, I make that step of confession and say, I need Him. And I call Him today, Lord and Savior. If, if that's you, and you're joining us online, we have a connection card. Just, just indicate that I want to become a follower of Jesus today. If you're, if you're here with us today and you've never made that step, I want you to just raise your hand. I want to pray with you right now. If you're just saying today's the day, I want to become a follower of Jesus. I want, just, just kind of wave at me so that I'll know that that's where your heart is today. We always give an invitation. 
Because Jesus is always seeking to save that, those which are lost. God, I, I, I thank you for your grace, your compassion, your love. And I pray that, God, we all just, we, we sense that, we walk in that, we're, we're healed by that, challenged by your heart. Let your kingdom come and your will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. And we give you the praise in the name of Jesus. And they all said, amen, amen.